Thinking about imaging the found down patient. Thanks uh, to everyone for coming this morning. Uh, my disclaimers, if you see a name on any of the images here, it's not the patient's name. It's actually the name of the person who contributed the case to MedPix. Uh, my current position is chief editor of MedPix at the National Library of Medicine. I have nothing to disclose. I've been through airport security so many times that they recognize me as I go through. They go, there's Jim again. Our learning objectives this morning, we're going to talk about the differential diagnosis for found down, how to choose the best imaging for each patient, each patient recognize imaging findings that will acutely change patient management, and uh, we won't have time to talk about a checklist uh, for imaging. So what is found down? What's the differential diagnosis for found down? It's a patient who's brought to the emergency department with limited history to suggest either a primary traumatic or a medical uh, etiology. Is there an ICD-9 code for patient down? Well, actually, there, there are two, and an ICD-10, I think there are eight different codes that translate into the found down patient. I, I didn't know exactly what found down meant, so I consulted with my uh, favorite colleague, Dr. Google, and I actually found out that there's a broad differential diagnosis for the patient who's found down. Altered mental status or unconsciousness, patient who may have different types of coma, the potential causes are trauma uh, and non-traumatic, and we're going to highlight uh, the non-traumatic causes in our discussion this morning. So again, what is found down? Uh, I, I actually thought about having this tattoo put on my own back here, found down, face down, call an ambulance, because that's exactly what you should do for the patient. So what fraction of patients found down actually have a combination of traumatic and medical conditions? And this is an important question because an undifferentiated patient coming to the emergency room may have suffered trauma as a result of something that caused a loss of consciousness, and so you can have a combination. And it's roughly about 10 to 20 percent of patients are going to have a combination of traumatic and medical conditions. And of course, there's a lot of literature on this uh, in the emergency medicine uh, journals. And again, it's very uh, important to remember that you can have a combination of acute medical conditions uh, and trauma. So when the patient comes in, a significant number of patients are going to have a combination of traumatic and non-traumatic, and also a significant percentage of patients, somewhere around 20%, are going to be mistriaged when they get to the emergency room. So what are the causes of coma? Again, physiologic and metabolic conditions and structural and anatomic lesions that are easy to recognize on the imaging study. I found this great acronym, and uh, one of the things that I keep mentioning is whenever there's an acronym, I can't remember what the letters stand for, but you can have alcohol, uh, intoxication, electrolytes and endocrine problems, uh, insulin, high or low glucose, ischemia and infarction, overdoses, uremia, trauma, infection, psychiatric and psychogenic, and seizures may render the patient to have an altered level of consciousness. So what's the best imaging? I, I think we all know that the primary go-to test that we use for a patient in the emergency room is going to be CT, but we can be a little bit, little bit smarter than that. And we can use MR in selective patients, especially if the patient comes in with a history of stroke. In some institutions, they're going to have an MR instead of a primary CT, and patients who present with uh, seizures. So let's talk about recognizing the imaging findings that will acutely change the patient's management. What kills uh, people with intracranial disease? Mass lesions, cerebral ischemia, cerebral hypoxia, and metabolic and toxins uh, that poison the brain. And we can have brain herniation and increased intracranial pressure. We can have ischemia that's secondary to increased intracranial pressure as well as due to arterial and venous occlusion dissection. We can have hypoxia, breathing the wrong gases, breathing CO2 or, C or carbon monoxide, not breathing oxygen, and various metabolic toxins. So we like to talk about the four H's of the neuroapocalypse. And what are the four H's? Well, the four H's are hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, herniation, and hypoxia and infarction. And I really worked hard to get the H in there to have four H's instead of three H's, but I actually found out that herninfarct is the Nordic and German term for brain infarction, so it actually fits uh, quite well there. And, and uh, thank you, Eric, for, for recognizing that. So again, we look for these things. We look for hemorrhage, large mass lesions causing herniation. We look for hydrocephalus and hypoxia and ischemia, and these are the things that we commonly look for. Uh, findings that are associated with increasing intracranial pressure, a big debate, does the patient need to have an intracranial pressure or monitoring device, small cisterns, 
Slit-like ventricles and dilated optic nerve sheaths are what's been reported in the literature. This patient had, uh, had uh, drowning and had diffuse cerebral edema, no cisterns. This patient has an obvious large mass causing significant herniation. This patient has obviously a significant hydrocephalus. And this patient has a, a hypoxic episode with diffuse gray matter edema, and there's no sulci here, uh, and the ventricles are relatively small. So how does this work uh, in the real world? And I want to kind of do a case-based approach to show how we use this. So here's a typical example. A 16-year-old girl from an automobile accident, motor vehicle crash, develops a decrease in the level of consciousness 20 hours after the accident. And here are the images. Not much to see here. You can fantasize seeing all kinds of things. You're probably right if you're fantasizing seeing abnormalities in the white matter. You do the uh, DWI and ADC pair. <coughs> And you see multiple very, very small punctate lesions in the deep white matter in the centrum semi-ovale in this patient who has a history of documented trauma. So these things match, telling us that this is possibly or probably going to be cytotoxic edema. Uh, and uh, that's typically caused by intracellular water, as we all know. And so the question is, is what are all of these lesions? She has a history of trauma, so is this going to be diffuse axonal injury? And the answer is no, because patients who have traumatic axonal injury or diffuse axonal injury typically have their neurologic deficit uh, at the time of the impact, and they do not have a delayed presentation. And that's a very important clinical thing to put into evaluation of the patient. So what this patient actually had was fat emboli. They had a long bone fracture here. And fat emboli are very, very common, but fat emboli syndrome is much less common. So this patient had a mid-shaft fracture of the femur, had multiple punctate lesions in deep white matter. The patient did have an echo that showed a patent foramen ovale, but about 20 to 30 30% of normal walking, talking humans on planet Earth also have a patent foramen ovale. And you don't have to have a patent foramen ovale to have fat embolization. So the patient had fat embolization. It may be associated with a long bone fracture. Uh, unlike lots of other material, the fat droplets from the bone marrow are deformable, and they can pass through the capillary bed in the lung uh, without having a, a right to left shunt or a PFO. And uh, they cause small focal white matter lesions. Most embolic material park themselves in the gray matter matter or the gray white matter junction, fat emboli park in the deep white matter. It's a very, very different kind of presentation. And people think that the abnormality we see is actually due to chemotoxicity from lysis of the marrow fat lipids. So uh, the patient's symptoms, again, resolved over time. Uh, the patient was treated with oxygen. There's no specific therapy for a fat embolism. Uh, how many of you went to medical school? So I just want to remind you, if you went to medical school and took dermatology, they said if the lesion is wet, you dry it. If the lesion is dry, you keep it wet. And if you don't know what it is, you give steroids. So lots of people give steroids to patients that have fat emboli. But there's no conclusive proof yet that that actually makes a difference. So about 90% of trauma patients have uh, fat emboli, but less than 5% uh, are going to have fat uh, emboli syndrome. If you have that, the mortality is 10%. Uh, it can be a fracture of any bone. It doesn't have to be a large bone. They may be hypoxic from emboli to the lung. They may have neurologic symptoms from the brain emboli. And one of the clinical pearls is they typically get a skin lesion. So it's the lungs, the brain, and the skin that are primarily affected by fat embolization. Here's a companion case here, patient in a motor vehicle crash. Again, the T2 image shows multiple punctate lesions uh, in the deep white matter, corresponding abnormalities on uh, DWI and, uh, and ADC. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, keep that in mind. Now, I want to show you a series of symmetric lesions in the brain, and they all have in common the fact that they are bilateral, uh, they are multiple, and they primarily involve the deep gray matter. And we'll try to go through these lesions and develop an intelligent differential diagnosis. <clears throat> But the thing that I want to emphasize is you oftentimes are not going to be able to make a radiologic diagnosis of exactly what the toxic or metabolic process is. So let's start out with a typical example, a real-world example. 41-year-old woman found unconscious at home, uh, no signs of trauma, no pills, etc., and she has these images. And this was actually a case from uh, Malcolm Grow Air Force Hospital at Andrews Air Force play, uh, Base, at Joint Base Andrews now, where, where Air Force One lands. And this was a long time ago, but uh, one of my colleagues, Amy Hall, called me up and she said, I have a comatose woman with a funny looking scan. And I said, Amy, what kind of funny is this? Is this funny ha-ha or funny strange? And Amy said, this is a really strange looking scan. She said, all of the white matter appears to be abnormally uh, hyperattenuating. 
And I said, so she's in coma. Does she have herniation? Does she have shift? Does she have hydrocephalus? Does she have a hematoma? Does she have hypoxia or infarction? And she said, I don't think she has any of these, but she's in a coma. And I said, is the white matter too white or is the gray matter too dark? And then there was a pause. And she said, you know what? Maybe it's all the gray matter being too dark. So if you look here, you have the lateral lenticular nuclei, the putamen. You have the occipital cortex here. You have the, uh, the frontal cortex here. Uh, and again, the occipital cortex that makes that heart shape. And that's one of the reasons why I love this case. But this is a patient that we have no history, diffuse bilateral abnormalities. She has edema. What kind of edema does she have? And one of the things that you want to remember is that the only kind of edema that you get in the gray matter is cytotoxic edema. Something has paralyzed the energy-dependent uh, pump, the sodium-potassium pump in the cell membrane, and because of that, you're having water shifting to being intracellular. So she has cytotoxic edema. So let's talk about uh, toxic and metabolic problems. We may need to have more history and or laboratory values to be able to sort these things out. We have a whole variety of drugs that are part of the routine screen for patients in the emergency room if the ER doc chooses to order them. We have a number of poisons that, again, they can test for. They can test for carboxyhemoglobin, methyl alcohol, ethylene glycol. And then, of course, we have the normal panel of serum electrolytes that we look for. And we can also add to that uh, looking at magnesium levels and looking at ammonia levels. So this patient's serum sodium was 121. So this patient was hyponatremic. She actually had psychogenic polydipsia. She was drinking more than a gallon of water every single day. This also happens in patients that have overhydration, hospitalized patients that are only given D5W and not given saline. Uh, and the treatment, again, can be fluid restriction. And more commonly, we give the patient some flavor of a slightly hypertonic saline. So this is water intoxication. Can you drink too much water? I know a lot of people are going to the parks, and it's warm, and it's humid, and you're encouraged to drink a lot of water, but it's it's really easy to make yourself hyponatremic, but typically not in the symptomatic level. This is a, a history of a woman who lost her sight after drinking too much water. So how do we treat hyponatremia? Uh, the patient has to have an urgent, uh, mild correction of the serum sodium, but the thing that's very important is you don't want to overly, rapidly correct the serum sodium levels. Because when you do that, the patient's going to get osmotic myelinolysis, which is an iatrogenic disease. So they have to correct the serum sodium, but they have to do it very gradually gradually over time. So osmotic myelinolysis, again, is iatrogenic disease invented by doctors in the 1950s at the Massachusetts General Hospital. It primarily involves the ponds in about two-thirds of cases. Uh, it's probably due to the fact that the osmotic shifts shrink the uh, endothelial cells, opening up the blood-brain barrier, damaging the oligodendrocytes. The endothelial cells shrink, very much like pouring salt on a snail. Has anyone ever done that? poured salt on a snail? Oh, you're vicious there. So, so anyway, if, if you pour salt on a snail, uh, they kind of shrivel up because of the osmotic gradients there. So this is the, the potential bad outcome of uh, overly rapidly correcting serum sodium and getting this uh, lesion of central pontine myelinolysis with the loss of myelin in the central ponds, some preservation of the uh, myelin on the corticospinal tracts because their neuronal cell bodies are, are located elsewhere. At least that's the prevailing theory. So osmotic myelinolysis. Let's take a look at another case. 27-year-old woman, gastric bypass four months ago, recurrent vomiting since the procedure. She presents with diplopia, vertical nystagmus, and medial and lateral extraocular muscle palsies. So here are the scans. And the scans are abnormal. And the lesions are multiple, and they're bilateral, and they're very symmetric. And just to highlight them for you, the hypothalamus on either side of the third ventricle, the medial portion of the thalami, the area that's sometimes called the pulvinar. So this is the, the abnormality that we have in the imaging. We look in the midline. Uh, the mammillary bodies look OK. Bilateral thalamic lesions have a very broad differential diagnosis. Uh, some viruses are neurotropic for the thalamus, metabolic disease diseases, prion diseases. We know that variant uh, CJD is supposed to involve the pulvinar. Some toxic lesions like osmotic myelinolysis, what we just talked about. And the vascular supply for the thalami, both the arterial and venous drainage, uh, they share in common. So you can have bilateral thalamic lesions. 
So somebody was very smart and they drew a thiamine level. Her thiamine was low. They gave her thiamine and she got better. So this is a patient that had Wernicke's encephalopathy, which should be one of the things that you consider in any patient who has protracted vomiting. So we know that carbohydrate metabolism is dependent on having thiamine. If you don't have thiamine, you develop a metabolic acidosis. And the body stores of thiamine are only for about two weeks. So depletion of thiamine can occur in about 14 days. Uh, there are many different causes aside from alcoholism associated with thiamine depletion, uh, cancer, GI surgery, hyperemesis gravidarum, starvation, fasting. Uh, but I want everyone to remember hyperemesis gravidarum because you'll have pregnant women that have all kinds of symptoms. And one of the things that we don't think about is that they might have Wernicke's disease because they're young and they're healthy and they're not alcoholic. The classic triad of Wernicke's encephalopathy is usually not present. It's only present in a minority of patients. And so we have to realize with the low sensitivity of the classic clinical triad, we have to broaden our differential diagnosis. The, one of the clinical pearls is that the patient can have a thiamine level drawn, and you're not going to kill a patient by giving them a parenteral injection of thiamine before the patient gets glucose. And I'm not going to suggest we do that in every patient, but this is something to keep in mind. So less than a third of alcohol alcoholics are diagnosed in life. Uh, less than 10% of non-alcoholics are diagnosed in life. You can save the patient's life if they're given uh, thiamine before they get glucose. And one of the things, again, to remember is hyperemesis gravidarum. It also occurs after bariatric surgery. And uh, this is a pearl from the literature. Wernicke's encephalopathy should always be considered when a pregnant woman has persistent vomiting and neurological signs and symptoms. Why am I emphasizing that? Because pregnancy is a very common condition. And so if you realize that pregnancy is a common condition and that there's 60,000 cases of hyperemesis gravidarum in the United States every year, you're very likely to see a symptomatic patient, a patient with neurologic symptoms in the ER who's pregnant who might actually have a disease that no one is going to think about. So always think about the possibility that the patient might have uh, thiamine uh, deficiency and might have Wernicke's encephalopathy. Uh, the differential between uh, normal morning sickness and hyperemesis is that uh, hyperemesis interferes with activity, they lose weight, and they're constantly nauseous. So just to go back to biochemistry 101, thiamine is important for conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. If you don't have the thiamine, then the patient's going to have a lactic acidosis, and that's going to be aggravated by giving them glucose. So how many of you went to medical school again? So we all learn to look at the mammillary bodies for a patient who has Wernicke's encephalopathy, but that's actually less than half the patients. More common lesions are around the third ventricle involving the hypothalamus and involving the pulvinar, uh, of, uh, involving the pulvinar of the thalamus. The tectal plate may also be abnormal, but of course some patients are going to have what used to be taught as the classic presentation where they have a bilateral mammillary body problems on imaging. So if we think about intoxicants, so let me show you a couple of cases uh, in that uh, ballpark. 36-year-old man unconscious in his car in the garage the morning after driving home from a party. He was brought to the ER by emergency medical services. So here are two of the CT scans that were done in the screening intake. I hope you see that they're both abnormal, that they have multiple lesions. The lesions are bilaterally symmetric. They're involving the deep gray matter, the medial portion of the lenticular nucleus, which is the globus pallidus. This is the classic presentation for a patient who has carbon monoxide intoxication. Involvement of the medial lenticular nucleus, involvement of the globus pallidus. So again, here we can see on the flare in the T2 that we have involvement of the gray matter. I just want to point out something to you. This is not gray matter. This is actually the internal capsule here. And we always talk about uh, uh, carbon monoxide causing damage to the gray matter of the globus pallidus, but in actual fact, it's not just limited to that. And again, we can see in the DWI that there's restricted diffusion there. So the patient's carbon monoxide intoxication was proven by the laboratory analysis and measuring levels of carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, most of us were taught that the toxicity of carbon monoxide is due to selective vulnerability of certain portions of the brain. But something that I learned from a neuropathologist uh, almost 30 years ago is that carbon monoxide is cardiotoxic. 
and that the localization in the globus pallidus and in the internal capsule may be vascular as well as doing to selective metabolic toxicity in the globus pallidus. And that area of the brain has a, a little bit more tenuous blood supply compared to the rest of the brain. So again here you want to notice and highlight that it's also the white matter of the internal capsule that is involved uh, in this patient with carbon monoxide intoxication. So patients with CO intoxication may appear to be intoxicated. They may actually appear to have ingested alcohol. They have headache, dizziness, etc. Carbon monoxide, again, selectively toxic for the medial lenticular nucleus, the area of the globus pallidus. Uh, we know carbon monoxide uh, is poisonous. We know it's very common. And uh, one of the most common sources of carbon monoxide intoxication, it was a surprise to me to learn, was actually using a generator when your power is out. So those of you who are from the Northeast probably remember Snowmageddon in 2010. Uh, we had in Washington, D.C. Uh, almost uh, three and a half feet of snow. Uh, there was no way to get through my neighborhood. Even a Humvee couldn't get in to retrieve someone's grandmother. Uh, at the end of four days without power, the an interior temperature in my house was 38 degrees. I learned that I could survive by sleeping with multiple other mammals. Uh, and <laughs> Immediately after, after everything was all cleared up and I could get out, I went to Home Depot and I went to buy a generator and I was forced to listen to a 30 minute lecture on how to hook up a generator and where to put it and not to put it in the garage and not to have the cable running through uh, an open door or a window because it'll suck in the carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide again uh, it tends to localize in the medial portion of the lenticular nucleus but it may be a combination of vascular sensitivity as well as metabolic sensitivity. And if the the patient dies, they're going to lose the neuronal cell bodies in the globus pallidus, so they're going to be pale instead of having that normal kind of a color. So carbon monoxide is very common. Remember that it may be vascular as well as selective vulnerability. A 23-year-old man brought to the emergency room, again, no prior history of drug abuse, no other history is available, he's comatose, uh, and he has a, an MR uh, set of images done. So in the coronal image, uh, you may be able to recognize there's some abnormality here involving the deep and the cortical gray matter around the sylvian fissure, uh, much more blatantly obvious when we look at the axial images on T2 and flare. We can see there is involvement bilaterally of the hippocampi, but there's also a significant amount of cortical involvement as well as involvement of the deep gray matter. So this patient has lesions involving the caudate, the lenticular nucleus, the thalamus, and the uh, cortical gray matter in the occipital lobe. So this is a relatively diffuse toxic or metabolic process. So we have once again localization of the gray matter suggesting that we have cytotoxic edema. We can develop a very broad differential diagnosis that we might have to sort through drowning, cardiac arrest, asphyxiation, uh, encephalitis, uh, toxic exposure or ingestion. Uh, and uh, in this particular patient, somebody was relatively smart and they said, you know, we need to screen this patient for organic alcohols like methanol uh, and ethylene glycol. And they pumped out the patient's stomach contents and the patient had ethylene glycol. The patient had ingested antifreeze. So this is a patient that had ethylene glycol poisoning. Relatively common in animals, not very common in humans, but oftentimes used for intentional suicide attempts. How many of you have heard of the lentiform fork sign? Uh, this is something I was unfamiliar with, but any cause of severe or profound metabolic acidosis can give you this sign where you have an abnormal signal in the, in the lenticular nucleus in the putamen and it, also in the globus pallidus, and it's outlined by the white matter bands in that location. And it's not specific for ethylene glycol. It's suggestive of any kind of uh, metabolic acidosis. So just as a reminder, ethylene glycol is odorless, but it actually will taste sweet. It's metabolized in the liver. It's the metabolic products that actually are going to hurt the patient. And one of the pearls that you may have learned in medical school is that uh, antifreeze ingestion, ethylene glycol, can cause calcium oxalate crystals to form in the urine. So if the patient's had an intake urinalysis in the ER, they may be able to see that if the tech who's doing the UA is actually familiar with that. So the minimum lethal dose is, is about 100 milliliters, and the toxicity, again, is from conversion uh, of the uh, ethylene glycol to uh, glycolic acid. So that was a patient who had uh, antifreeze poisoning. Let's look at another case here, a 42-year-old man, an alcoholic, works as a carpenter, found down in his workshop on a Monday morning, a, kind of a sidebar, he was a Redskins fan, and the Redskins had lost the night before, so he was very despondent about uh, his favorite skins losing. So he comes in, 
And uh, he has these images here, the CT and the uh, MR. Again, we have multiple lesions. They're bilateral. They're symmetric. In this particular case, they're involving the caudate and the lenticular nuclei, but not so much involving the thalamus. He has hemorrhage in the caudate nucleus and hemorrhage in the lenticular nucleus. And uh, these lesions, the putamen and the caudate head, suggest some kind of a toxic or metabolic process. So this is a patient who had methanol intoxication. And uh, methanol is sometimes found in moonshine. Uh, it only takes about 10 to 30 milliliters of the methanol uh, to kill a patient or to cause uh, retinal blindness. You don't get cortical blindness from uh, methanol intoxication. And again here, sadly, in the autopsy, we see a perfect outline of the caudate nucleus and a perfect outline of the, uh, the lenticular nucleus here uh, and the putamen. So uh, methanol intoxication appears to be selectively attacking the lenticular nucleus, the lateral portion, but in this particular case, it also affected the caudate nucleus. So going back to the MR, you can see that there's a perfect correlation. So when you have methanol intoxication, again, it's that alcohol dehydrogenase creates formic acid and formaldehyde. Those metabolic products are what are going to hurt the patient. Uh, how many of you remember in medical school that they said you could get IV ethanol as a treatment for methanol intoxication? Do you all remember learning that in medical school? So I, I, I flunked my biochem exam uh, and uh, I, I didn't have any money as, as a medical student, so I, I thought that I would pretend that I had methanol intoxication and go to the ER so they'd give me some IV ethanol uh, as the treatment. Uh, there actually are other treatments, dialysis and also fomepazole or antazol uh, is a, a competitor that will shut off the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. Companion case for this one, 46-year-old man had a toxic ingestion many years before. This is a follow-up for blindness, and we see here uh, perfectly symmetric lesions involving the lateral portion of the lenticular nuclei, involving the putamina bilaterally, no lesions at all in the occipital lobes. Just as a reminder, methanol causes blindness by toxicity to the retina, not by causing toxicity to the gray matter of the occipital lobe. So it's retinal toxicity. So again, this is a different patient here, but the lesion in this patient is strictly limited to the putamen and doesn't involve the caudate nucleus in this patient with methanol intoxication. Uh, 24-year-old woman. This will be the last case we go through. Pregnant woman, drowsiness, weariness. Uh, she's hypertensive, so we're thinking about eclampsia, preeclampsia. Uh, she has lesions, again, involving the uh, lenticular nucleus bilaterally. Uh, this is a more typical or classic case of the lentiform fork sign in this patient. Uh, we can see corresponding abnormalities in the DWI and the ADC map. And this is a woman that had the HELP syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets, and severe preeclampsia. Eclampsia, uh, and this is typically a self-limited disease that resolves on its own over time, uh, but it's something very important to keep in mind when a pregnant woman uh, comes to the emergency room. So I want to summarize uh, what we had a chance to talk about this morning. Uh, we talked about the differential diagnosis for found down, which is very, very broad. Many different things can cause a, an altered mental status. They can be traumatic or non-traumatic, and the patient may have a combination of both. Uh, these are the cases that we looked at of symmetric lesions involving the gray matter and sometimes the cortical uh, gray matter as well as the deep gray matter. This was a patient with water intoxication. Uh, that is much more common than we think it is, especially when we encourage athletes to drink water when they're actually sweating electrolytes and sodium. Uh, this is a case I didn't show you, but this was a patient found in an inverted automobile in a creek. It was a near drowning, uh, and the patient has symmetric lesions in the caudate nucleus and lenticular nucleus. Uh, just as a reminder, there's a big differential diagnosis for that pulvinar sign. Always think in a woman, a young woman who's pregnant, uh, a young woman who's had bariatric surgery, anyone who's had gastrointestinal surgery, surgery that they may be thiamine depleted. This was uh, ethylene glycol ingestion, suicidal. This is the HELP syndrome. This was methanol intoxication. And this here was carbon monoxide intoxication. Again, all of these things are symmetric. They're all toxic or metabolic, but they have different specific toxins or metabolic problems causing them. And we started out by looking at a case of fat embolism where we have multiple punctate lesions involving the centrum semiovale and the deep gray matter. Not a typical location for embolized material, probably due to chemotoxicity from lysis of the fat droplets from the marrow.
arrow. So remember this mnemonic and try to remember the letters, A-E-I-O-U, TIPS. These are all the things that can cause the patient to have an altered mental status or coma. And I'm pretty close to running out of time. So I want to thank you all very, very much for your kind attention this morning. Thank you.